Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. And today we're going to talk about some new ways to do content marketing and especially one that has been proven to be incredibly effective because not only does your content get in front of your target market, but it's the content that they want to see, which makes it more effective still. So I am excited for today's episode of the Author to Authority podcast. I would like to welcome Mark Hirschberg to the show today. He's the author of the Career Toolkit, Essential Schools for Success That No One Taught You, and creator of the Brain Bump app. Uh, he has a very interesting past here that we're going to talk a little bit about today from tracking criminals and terrorists on the dark web to creating marketplaces and new authentication systems mark has spent his career launching and developing new ventures at startups and fortune 500 companies and in academia with over a dozen patents to his name that's pretty impressive he helped start the Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, dubbed MIT's Career, Sex, Exce, Career Success Accelerator, where he teaches annually. He is also one of the top-ranked ballroom dancers in the country. But the one that I, that I think is going to be most beneficial for today is that he is a high-level B2B and B2C lead generation expert welcome to the show mark thank you so much for having me it is my pleasure to be here with you today so mark let's start off with just something that's kind of obvious because i think people have gotten stuck in a rut when it has come to content marketing are there new ways to content market in 2024 there are indeed and it's shocking that it's taken us this long to do it. Now, as you know, to my bio, I have been doing lead generation for many years, created literally billions of dollars in leads through the companies I've been at. We would do hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. And it was a lot of content-based marketing. It was, we're going to offer you something, but of course we need to get your information. We need to get something because people want to sell you something. And so it was a, a fair trade. And one of the patents you mentioned, I have over a dozen. One of those patents was actually about 10 years ago, a new way to do that and to model people's behavior to determine intent. Now, fast forward a couple years, when I was doing my book, I recognized there's a problem with most books. Where you read information isn't where you need information. Ah, uh, yes. Right? And it, it's just, we never even think about it because it's just inherent in a book. A book, which is technology that goes back 2,000 some years, physical book, and you just have to have it with you. And so whenever you read a self-help book, a business book, maybe even like an exercise book, you're reading it in one time or place, but you're using the information elsewhere. And that's a disconnect. And we just accept that. Now, I know from years of teaching, you mentioned I've been teaching at MIT for over 20 years. My students were in the class, were teaching them skills, and we teach professional development, leadership, networking, negotiating. Now, at MIT, we also teach how to solve equations, and in class, will solve the equation, but you're not leading or networking very often in class, even though these are interactive classes. So there's a disconnect from where they're learning it to where they're applying it. And here again, I know my students, I swear, as soon as they walk out of class, you could see the information just like spill out of their ears and disappear. <laughs> Until exam time, right? Uh, right? Well, after that last exam, that's where just like they walk out of the last class, the last final, it's gone. It's gone off into the ether. And so I was thinking about this and saying, well, I know as an author, I want to a, help people retain this because I care about them. That's why I wrote the book. It's not about how much money can I make. Can I help people? But then also I realized word of mouth marketing doesn't work if people can't remember you or your brand. That's an inherent problem. <laughs> but it turns out there's a solution because I want them to remember it. They want to remember it. And so if we can find a way to help them remember, they'll remember the content, 
but they'll also remember your brand and the value you provide. And now this goes back to what we said at the start and what you mentioned in the introduction, which is that if you can do relevancy, that's what's going to make it really sticky. And now here is where, again, it's been right in front of us, like fish and water, we just accepted this as true. If you look at the channels we have, they do not work for evergreen content. The channels we tend to use, email and social media, they are linear channels. So if you're a thought leader and you're saying, well, it's Thursday afternoon, I'm gonna send out my leadership tip of the week. So you blast it out to all of your people on your mailing list or all your followers on social media. Half of them aren't even paying attention. They're not on social media or it's a busy day. The ones who do might look and say, yeah, lovely tip. It's not wrong, but that's not helpful. So I'm not going to waste any of my mental capacity and limited time focusing on that, focusing on your tip, focusing on your brand. You didn't give me anything. You just had to delete your email. You wasted some of my time today. That's not what we want. And it's not the fault of the content creators. That's how we do it. Same thing, by the way, with blogs and podcasts. This podcast, it's coming out. And people are probably your listeners who know there's great value in your shows. They get this show probably when it comes out because it's next on their list. And it may or may not be their need today. Mm. The problem is in six months from now. So you ignore the leadership tip today because you're fundraising, you're selling, you're hiring. Six months from now, when now you say, oh, now I'm leading a big team. Now I need that advice. You're not saying, let me look through all those old emails to find the nugget. Let me scroll back through all your social media posts of the last year. If someone's looking at your year's worth of social media posts, it's probably because you said something stupid and now they're looking for history of bad <laughs> things. And it's because these channels, these are broadcast channels. I'm going to just blast out and know it's going to land with a small percent of the audience. But as you noted, if we can flip that and let yeah. the audience control, here is what I need here and now, today, all of a sudden you land with relevancy. They are going to be more receptive to it. They're going to remember it better but they're also going to remember and value your brand more because you always deliver when they need help. And that creates brand trust. Mm. I love that word that you use there, disconnect. And, and it's true, we are so disconnected because we see something. I mean, I do it all the time. I see something and I think, oh, that would be great like a little bit down the road, but then a little bit down the road, you can't remember where it was to begin with. and. You just kind of hope and pray that maybe something comes back up again. But you are so correct with the disconnect. And, you know, even with these podcast episodes, I do three a week. So six months from now, you're going to be scanning back quite a bit to find a podcast episode that we did today. So, Mark, I want to dive into this a bit deeper, but we are going to stop for a quick ad break. If you are thinking about writing a book for your business, if you want to use, uh, you know, a book to get credibility, authority, marketing, all of those types of things, but you're not sure if you're ready yet, I want you to listen to this quick ad about the create and scale method. It's a checklist that's going to help you determine if you are ready to move forward with writing your book. We'll be right back. Mark, I, I've just really been enjoying this conversation and I know I know where it's leading and so I, I don't wanna jump too far ahead, but let's just take a moment and, and, and step back there because I wanna hear a little bit more about your story and then we're gonna finish off with the rest of this because what you've got to share is pretty amazing. But give us some more highlights about your life. Sure, I've had a very interesting path I graduated from MIT in the 90s and started out as a software engineer and then moved on. I said I wanted to become an executive, a CTO, a chief technology officer. And I've now been running as a CTO, CPO, technology product officer, a whole bunch of tech companies, some classic startups where I've been three people in a room, some Fortune 500s who have said we want to play startup 
and we've got the money, but we don't know how to do it. And so I've helped these large companies innovate. And then as you noted, my time in academia, I started this program at MIT. I also helped start a course at Harvard Business School. And so I've done a lot of innovation throughout my career, but in parallel, one thing I recognized, the skills I needed to get there, leadership, communication, team building, even hiring, these are not skills anyone sits you down to teach you. So I had to develop them on my own. I recognized I wanted my whole team to have these skills. So I began to upskill my team. And as I was doing that, MIT had gotten feedback where they're saying, no college is really teaching this. We want to see it, not just in early grads, not just in engineers, but in everyone. So that led to the program and through some networking, communication, luck, uh, I wound up getting involved and helped to develop the course and have been teaching there since, which then led to the book and also now my speaking and then inspired the app. Okay, I only got one question for you. Whatever made you decide to take up ballroom dancing? Ballroom dancing, it's funny, I was forced to do it in sixth grade where my mother said, you need to know how to dance for your wedding. And I hated it because boys <laughs> had to wear a jacket and tie and you actually had to touch girls. This is before we had cootie shots. So really horrible experience. <laughs> In college, however, by this point, all the girls had their cootie shots. It was a lot safer at this point. So I got into it. I had just been introduced to someone from Wellesley. I thought ballroom dancing would be a fun thing to do. And we started doing some of the classes together. Uh, most people don't know this. MIT, the time I was there, not only do we have one of the biggest ballroom clubs, we had, I think, the largest ballroom team. And we were one of the top ballroom teams, if not the very top, in the country. I got a different girlfriend. It didn't work out with the first one. She's still a friend of mine. But my new girlfriend, I got her into ballroom dancing. And she decided she wanted to compete which apparently meant I had also decided I wanted to compete. <laughs> and I am so glad that that happened because it was one of the best things I have done in my life. So did this, this girlfriend become more than a girlfriend? She is happily married with a wonderful child, still a friend of mine. Uh, but no, we were partners and dated, but wasn't a long-term fit for more than dancing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. You know what I, I've realized is that, you know, when you do creative things, so dance, art, music, uh, for me, I'm a crafter. I love to craft. Um, it releases a lot. When you use that side of your brain, it actually releases creativity in other areas as well. Sometimes I'll just take an afternoon off and craft. And I just put aside the business and I craft for a while, but it's amazing when I'm using that creative side of the brain, what other ideas just kind of pop in when you're not really trying to think about them. Exactly. Even for my blog posts these days, I write a new post every week. Sometimes right now I have two posts a week coming out on different brands of mine. I'll just go for a walk and I won't focus on something. I'll just go for a walk. I'll let my mind kind of free flow. And I come back and now have three new ideas for what to write about. Do you know the place I get the most ideas? Shower? Yeah. I actually have a waterproof notebook in my shower because I'm, I'm relaxed and all these thoughts come. So I actually have a, a notebook in my shower so I can write all these really brilliant things down because by the time I get out, I get dry to get dressed. I forgot what I was thinking about. <laughs> The reason for this, this is very common. The reason is because when we're in the bathroom, showering or anything else, brushing our teeth, whatever, we're doing something that doesn't require very active focus of our mind. You can be half asleep and you can bathe yourself or brush your teeth. And that lets your mind wander. It lets that secondary part of your brain, I'm forgetting the term for it, really start to wander. I'll mention there was an MIT alum who actually wanted to, he wanted to donate some money and big donors like to sponsor buildings, get their name on a building or a classroom. He wanted to sponsor a bathroom because he said, this is where he got his best ideas. <laughs> <But> MIT. <laughs> 
I will note, I tried an experiment for a bit. You can actually replicate this. So I had tried, I said, let me see if I can create that kind of ingenuity. And I just, as I was standing in my living room, fully closed, I imagined washing myself, right? If I had a bar of soap, okay, I'm washing my arm, I'm washing my stomach, and just going through the motion as if I was doing it and letting my mind wander. And it actually helped me solve a problem without having to get undressed and get in the shower. So you can potentially, <laughs> give it a try yourself, you can potentially replicate this without all the water. Mm. I, I wrote a little book called 31 Productivity Hacks, and it's not available publicly. It's only available if you kind of buy my products and services. But I talked about showers. So, you know, if you're in a creative industry where you have to, you know, be creative, design, you know, things like that, take longer showers. If you're in a, a career where, you know, it's, it's very sort of mindless and you just have to plug through, take shorter showers because I'll give you an extra hour of work each week. <laughs> very well said. Okay, Mark, I want to get to the good stuff. I really want to get to the good stuff. So I'm going to let you loose. I want you to kind of finish off what you were there and, um, you know, talking about how you were developing this so that, you know, people didn't have the disconnect. And I know that you've got something amazing that you want to share with us. So I want to let you loose to do that for, you know, a few minutes, and then we're going to talk about your book. Sure. We talked about the challenge where you read something is different from where you need something. And we're saying reading, but it applies to books, blogs, podcasts, classes, talks. There's a disconnect to information. And we've had this amazing technological revolution in the last couple of years, 15 years in human history, where we can now connect information to a time and place. Thanks to the cell phone because all the information is in our pockets, but the key is making it accessible. In theory, I've got all these Kindle books that are sitting in my phone, but you're not gonna say, wait, it's somewhere in this Kindle book. Let me uh, open up this book, note that book. Oh, now I have to search through it. That's hard. Even if you have notes saved, I used to take notes and save in Google Drive. You have to open it, you have to find it. So we create an app called Brain Bump. And here's how it works, Brain Bump, takes the key ideas from books, blogs, podcasts, classes, and talks. We are content creator friendly. So we work with the author or speaker or podcaster. You control what goes in. I heard from lots of people, they'll say, when, when I go to these book summary apps, they summarize my book wrong. It's not my message. And they're really trying to tell people, use us instead of buying the book. We are friendly to authors and others. So you control what goes in there. The app users, and by the way, this is all free. The app is free, it's free for content creators, free for app users. Your audience then says, I'm reading your book or I'm interested in exploring your book. So I'm going to get these tips on the app. So they have all the tips, think like little tip cards, like a Q and A or a flashcard app, mm -hmm. but it's not Q and A, it's just the tip. It's what they'd highlight in your book. It's the quote that people pull out from a podcast. These all go into the app and they are all tagged by topic. Think like hashtags on social media. These are your topics. Now there's two access modes. The first is just in time. So for example, there's a bunch of networking tips in my book that you will probably read sitting at home and you will probably need two months later as you're at a conference. So as you're walking into the conference, you're in the hotel lobby trying to get to the hall you can open the app, tap networking as a topic, and there are all the networking tips. And you just flip through them one after another. Say, oh, right, do this. Oh, yep, remember to do that. Oh, here are the icebreaker questions. Here's how I start a conversation. Here's how I get out of a conversation. They're all there and you can get in seconds. Our mission is it should take no more than seven seconds for you to retrieve the information you need. So whether you're doing it by topic or you're doing the search for it, you have it and get within seconds. The other mode is a foundational mode. Let's suppose you are a new manager saying, okay, I've been reading this manager book, but you can't say to a subordinate, wait, time out, hold on, I've got to open an app and look up the answer to this. You need to remember it. So you can set up the equivalent of a daily affirmation. 
every weekday at 9 a.m. as you go into the office, you get a management tip from this blog or this podcast or this book or all three, because you can grab content from across different sources. You don't even need to open the app. It just pops up. You look, say, right, good tip. You see the source, the branding comes in, swipe, you're done. And by being reminded of it every day, it's going to stay top of mind. And by the way, you might also say, I want to get a marriage tip at 6 p.m. because my marriage is on the rocks. Yeah. But the key is that a marriage tip at 9 a.m. or a management tip at 6 p.m. not helpful. By getting the right tip in the right time and place, it lands and is valuable. And all these tips, they all come with the branding, your cover art, your name, the name of your, your podcast or your book. They're all hyperlinked. This is the other great thing because we mentioned chronological ordering isn't great. And who's looking at your podcast episode from three years ago or your blog post from three years ago? Maybe they find in a search, but here, because it's not ordered by time, they see, here's the key idea. So, oh, really good point. You know, I wanna go deeper. I wanna read a little more, hear a little more. They can click through. And so it's driving traffic back to your evergreen content. And unlike social media, you're not saying, oh, I have to post. Oh, I have to post again. Once it's in the app, the app continually recycles the information to the people who are saying, this is what I need at this time and location. And so it's a much better ROI for the content creators. You put it in once and forevermore, it appears to your audience. And it's better for them because they always get what they need when they need it everybody wins. It is a hundred percent free and the app brain bump it's available on Android and iPhone stores, hundred percent free. So content creators can put their stuff there and connect to their audiences to build their brands. Mm, that's good stuff there, Mark. Thank you. One thing I was, I was thinking about is, so you talked about podcasts. So how would that work in terms of a podcast? Would it be something where I have to manually upload like notes for each episode or would it be like you have an RS feed that just pulls it in? Everyone's asking, well, can't you just have AI pull out these highlights? The answer is maybe. Now we're recording this in early 2024 and if you ask AI, can you summarize this transcript for me or this blog post or pull out the key quotes, it kind of does it and gets it right maybe. Sometimes it gets this one sentence and you really wanted two sentences or maybe the opposite. It's not yet ready for prime time. We don't yet know who the AI winner is and we don't yet want to build all the interface. So what we tell people you, the, the author of the podcast or the content creator, you control it. How you generate these is up to you. Lots of podcasters, for example, they will pull out the quotes because you have the quote clips, the audio clips. You might even put the quotes in the show note. Say, so however you're doing that, you just keep doing it. To put those quotes into the system, you can either, you click a button, and it takes 20 seconds, you copy paste, Here's the title of the episode. Here's a link to the episode. And here's the quote. And here's the topics. Or you put into the spreadsheet template and then you just upload the spreadsheet. And that, for example, for people who have existing back catalog, you have hundreds of episodes. You don't want to click add new quote, add new quote. We say, look, just get your VA, get someone to just fill out the spreadsheet. Each row, here's the quote, here's the topic, here's the link, here's the title. And you just upload the spreadsheet and you're done. One and done. Okay. My brain is spinning with ideas, but we do only have a few minutes left. So we won't go down that road today. But Mark, I think we will be having you back on the show. But what I would love to do right now is just shift because we always uh, do a short interview with every author that comes on the show. And uh, there is a question that every author gets asked. So Mark, are you ready for the question? Sock it to me. Okay. Oh, wait, I forgot to do one thing first. Okay, we'll do one thing first and then ask you the question. So first of all, let's introduce your book because nobody knows who it is, what it is. I mean, I do, but nobody else really does. So. 
you know, introduce your book and then I'll ask you the question. My book, which was inspired by the class at MIT, although written for a general audience, not students or engineers, the book is called The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. 10 chapters on 10 different topics, 10 different skills that we have seen time and again, people are telling us you need to be effective, but they're never taught to us. Love it. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you the question. So Mark, what was the good, the bad, the ugly about writing, editing, and publishing that book? Great question. And I have a whole long talk on this, but here's the, the short version. The writing was the easiest part. Now I wrote it in about four and a half months, but the asterisk that goes with it is I've been teaching this for 20 years. It was just a matter of how I pulled out of my head and put it on paper. And we've had 20 years to see what works, what doesn't, how to explain it well. That's what made the writing easy. Something that did go very well was the cover design. And if you look at the cover of the book, we have this iconography. Each chapter, like leadership or networking, has this little icon. It looks a little like clip art. And each one has their own little image. We use that iconography not only on the cover, but also on the website. In a prior version of the app, we had the Career Toolkit app that was dedicated just for that. And it used the same iconography. I use it in my talks. I use it in my social media. So I was able to create a brand that's not just my cover, but goes further. The bad, the company who I use to do some of the mechanics, really, really bad. Uh, for example, the layout, every time they'd fix one thing, they'd cause new problems. And it took us three months to get the layout right. This is not a super complicated book, but it's just one mistake after another. The proofreading, my father and I, thank, I really appreciate my parents, caught another, we caught another 20 errors after the proofreading. I caught errors in the indexing. So unfortunately, that service, it was just one problem after another. Great job with the cover design, but the rest was really problematic. Yeah. So I will give you a hint and tip, Mark. Even after proofreaders, there's still times that you can, you'll can you probably find one or two mistakes. The, no book is ever perfect. Actually, the, the one book back there, Selling from the Heart, um, when I did that with Larry Levine, I mean, I had read it, I don't know how many times Larry had read it, his teammate, Daryl had read it. Uh, we had it proofread. He had at least 10 people read it before it went to publication. It sold thousands of copies in the 18 months and 18 months in somebody found a typo. We found after our first print run, I think it was a little into the first print run, I did catch one thing that had gone to print some verb and we had an ed ending that changed to ing but it ended with eding <laughs> you could as a reader in fact the readers will just skip over they know exactly what you're saying and they just ignore whichever part was the typo but we did correct it for the second print so now there are the rare first edition the first not edition the first print run you can find these rare, rare copies let's pretend they're going to be collector's items one day you know what some people have done is they've intentionally left errors in the book and then anybody who contacts them telling them about the error, they win some sort of free content. And of course they have to give their email address to get the free content. So it actually becomes a lead generation thing. That is a really clever idea. I've definitely seen in contracts in the EULAs, the end user license agreement, people bury things in there to prove no one's actually reading it. I'm one of the few people who will try to read these when I can, but yeah, most I, people- I try, I try, but it doesn't, I only get a few paragraphs in and I'm like, I am so done with this. <laughs> Mark, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I have so enjoyed having you on today. So two things I would love for you to share a final thought. And for those who have really enjoyed today's episode and want to connect with you and uh, find out more about Brain Bump, how can they do that? For Brain Bump, you can go to the website brainbumpapp.com. 
So at brainbumpapp.com, it's a one-page website. You can follow links to the store to download the app to try it out. There's an explainer video, so you can see how it works, 90-second video. At the bottom, for the content creators, which most of this audience is, at the bottom, there is a contact form. And you click that, it's going to take 30 seconds, just give us your name, your email, your website, tell us a little about you. And we'll be in touch about how you can, for free, get your contact, get your content onto the Brain Bump app and then use it to be sticky with your audience. My other website, by the way, the book, the career toolkit book.com. And there's a contact form there and there's information about the book. But I suspect most people like to go to brainbumpapp.com. Thank you so much, Mark. It has been a joy and a pleasure having you on the show today. Well, thank you again for having me. I have really enjoyed being here and hope to do it again. Did you share a final thought? <laughs> My final thought, we've talked about switching from this linear content model to non-linear where your content arrives when and where it's needed. Now, Brain Bump is one way to do that, but it's not the only way. So you can, for example, with the content on your website, if you have a CMS, you can do tagging there as well to let people not just see it in order, but to go to the topics they need. If you look at my book website, thecareertoolkitbook.com, and you look at the blog, you can see you can look by topic to drill in not to the most recent, but to the most relevant to you. You can build email drip lifts where it is organized by topic and someone can say i need this advice from you right now and they sign up and they maybe get a 10 cycle email blast for 10 weeks with relevant content so there's more than one way to do it but with brain bump we certainly try to make it very easy and turnkey for you and completely free but be creative find other ways where your content gets delivered to your audience when and where they need it hmm. Good stuff there, Mark. Audience, where to go to next? If you are watching on YouTube, I would love for you to click the thumbnail somewhere here on the screen. We're going to be sending you to episode 472, Three Simple Ways to Make Your Content Stand Out. If you're on your favorite podcast app, you're not going to have to scan back too far this time because uh, this is episode 489. You're only scanning back to episode 472. Thanks so much for listening, and we will see you on the very next episode. Bye now. <laughs>